Thank you and a very good afternoon to uh, everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, let me also express my thanks to uh, PRI for uh, inviting me to uh, share some uh, brief comments. Uh, I'd like to uh, share three thoughts in the next uh, few minutes. One uh, is the history of our governance uh, framework with respect to uh, the Singapore exchange. Two, the uh, growing focus of uh, sustainability in Asia uh, and Singapore. And then uh, third and lastly, how SGX can play a further role to be relevant to PRI uh, with respect to our strategy. So first, uh, SGX uh, shares uh, Singapore's proposition of uh, strong governance, the opportunities offered in an ecosystem that's premised on trust have uh, supported SGX in providing a well-connected, well-regulated multi-asset market infrastructure that enables investors to trade out of Asia across a range of asset classes in one place. Our history dates back to 1999, where we began as a holding company, which then established itself as Asia's most international exchange. Governance has always uh, had that special place in our modest operandi. Enhanced transparency of our listed companies through the disclosure of material information was more pronounced in the early 2000s when Singapore shifted from a merit-based regime for its capital markets to a market-driven, disclosure-based regime of supervision. This progress makes SGX's commitment towards the reporting of non-financial data by our listed companies significant and meaningful, which I will discuss. As a market operator, we recognize the importance for creditors and investors to know their funds are responsibly managed and utilized. Taking cue from the uh, MAS, which introduced the first version of the Code of Corporate Governance in 2001 and made revisions thereafter in 2005 and 2012, SGX has embraced the culture of disclosure when advocating corporate uh, governance practices. Even though compliance with the code is not mandatory, SGX has supported MAS efforts by requiring listed companies under our listing rules to disclose their corporate governance practices and give explanations to deviations from the codes in their annual reports. We're also committed to upholding high regulatory standards that are aligned with and befitting of Singapore's uh, reputation. We as a company, as an exchange, uh, is compliant with the highest international standards for payment, clearing and settlement uh, under the CPS ISCO standards and will rank joint first in 2014 in the Corporate Governance Watch Survey by the Asian Corporate Governance uh, Association. Secondly, uh, as you are aware, sustainable investment in, is fast growing in demand, especially amongst uh, global institutional investors. The results from the 2014 Global Sustainable Investment Review show that global assets invested in the sustainable investment rose 61% from 2012 to reach 21.4 trillion in 2014 and represents over 30% of total AUM in the region studied. We are also seeing such growth in Asia too. Though still behind Europe and US, the market for funds employing sustainable investing strategy is growing rapidly in the region with Singapore and Indonesia leading the charge. This is driven largely by govern, uh, governmental policies. Islamic funds are a major contributor to that sector in Indonesia, while Singapore is positioning itself as a centre for technology and sustainable investment practices. Recently, the government also launched its Climate Change Plan, a further testament of the government's commitment to a sustainability cause. With such growing focus on uh, sustainable investment, economies which fail to see this trend will be left behind. Markets which traditionally play the role of facilitating exchange of information will now also dive into business interactions to understand the information exchanges and create awareness on the implication of the underlying trends. Investing companies are not only encouraged to make risk disclosure, but will also have to articulate whether the manner in which they address the risks are coherent when read with the values of their investors. We have been an advocate of sustainable investment uh, and have taken significant steps in this direction to ensure that SGX listed companies have the support they need to meet the needs of today's stakeholders. At SGX, our mandate is to offer 
a fair, orderly and transparent market and is conscientious in taking responsible measures towards facilitating information that is relevant to investors. This includes introducing uh, sustainability reporting on a comply or explain basis to support companies' efforts in meeting growing interests in sustainability worldwide. Sustainability reporting, while it's not a new concept, it was introduced on a voluntary basis in 2011, but its growing importance in the eyes of investors, customers, and all stakeholders have now raised the need for us to make it mandatory. Providing non-financial information benefits both investors and companies alike. Investors gain greater visibility and are able to make better informed investment decisions, while companies have the opportunity to identify areas for improvement and can then enhance their practices and work towards attaining more sustainable growth. We at SGX has also introduced a uh, sustainability index uh, because we believe that uh, ESG indices provide an avenue which investors can make more informed decisions. They clearly provide transparency into the company's sustainable practices and can be used to identify companies that are leading on the ESG credentials. Third, let me now touch on uh, how uh, SGX can further play a role to be relevant to PRI uh, with regard to our business strategy. We aim ourselves to be a multi-asset market infrastructure. In that regard, uh, not only do we have equities, derivatives, commodities, FX, and fixed income uh, on our platform, we also pursue a country strategy where any investors coming through our exchange, if you choose to pick a country for investment, for example, China, you can gain access uh, through the exchange in terms of our equity uh, derivatives index. You could also gain access uh, through our commodities in terms of the INR contract. You could also gain access through China by expressing your view uh, on the currency contract on uh, CNH. By that, with multiple asset classes and country verticals, we hope the efficiency that is being created and uh, obviously the better and uh, lower cost of execution in some ways will allow companies or investors to find that uh, being efficient in terms of having uh, uh, efficient investments. So the, with that, uh, let me thank you for your time and I'll take uh, questions and your patience uh, in uh, listening to me. And I hope as a member of the uh, investment community and the broader financial industry, you'll find in Singapore much that meets your interest in responsible investing and growth opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lo Bun Chai. And yes, I have got some questions. <laughs> I'm never short of a question, I'm afraid. Um, if we can start with the sustainability reporting requirements that kick in next year for you on a comply or explain basis, how do you ensure that they don't just become box ticking? Or if not box ticking, it doesn't just engender an entire industry of people who say, oh, you have these requirements, we'll look after them for you. You know, there's no actual cultural change within a company. It's just another thing that they have to do. Yes, uh, we're conscious and aware of uh, being uh, an, an enabler to creating a new uh, consultancy industry. I think uh, you already have a little bit, <laughs> looking on the internet. <laughs> so, Just a couple of uh, yeah. so our approach to uh, introducing sustainability reporting as a mandatory uh, requirement on a comply or explain basis uh, as follows. We feel that uh, companies today, uh, for management, either you are owners of the assets or are stewards of the assets, you think about your business risk on a daily basis. You think about that in terms of how you sustain your business model. Uh, so for example, if you are a shipyard builder, uh, you must be uh, very mindful and conscious of safety of your workers. So your uh, employment policies, the way you look after safety of your workers are clearly paramount. How do you then explain that in the context of a sustainable business model? Does that fall into the S of ESG? Maybe that's what you need to think about. And then if you are an offline to online business where logistics uh, or technology uh, is clearly a key ingredient to that, so how you move uh, your goods from point A to point B using logistics, you must be thinking about whether carbon emission is clearly a business threat uh, to you. So how do you explain that in terms of a sustainable business model in the E part of ESG? So we like to approach that from that point to allow and help businesses to articulate their risks clearly 
in the form of a sustainable business model, and then maybe for the convenience, that is sustainability reporting. So we try and approach it in that fashion than just having a box ticking exercise without a true cultural change. You, of course, spent a long time in the private sector in, in, with the asset managers before you came to uh, SGX. And we heard yesterday from Leanne Signor about the challenges of uh, continuous disclosure and transparency versus long-term sustainable investment. Now that you run an organisation like a stock exchange, how do you think that you balance it? How do you say to companies that, in fact, it's not the short-term focus when you know that every single analyst wants a quarterly number? Yes, I do face that uh, quarterly reporting pressure. I look at it in the form of a uh, milestone, a goalpost, a checkpoint, as you need to deal with short-term pressures in terms of updating your results, but not really forgetting your long-term goals, and which is why I think sustainability is really important. How do you explain that while you get short-term gyration, your long-term strategy in terms of a sustainable business model remains unchanged? Uh, there's no such a thing as a continuous uh, upward sloping business cycle. You have to go through that gyration and those are the, the goalposts, the markers that you come up to explain what has happened in the last three months, the last six months, but not taking your uh, eye off the ball in terms of long-term sustainable business model. It sounds great in theory, but in practice, is it a bit hard, is it difficult for companies when there is so much pressure on that short term? Because often it, it, it appears that it becomes a short term sacrifice. True, but uh, if you look at uh, history, uh, businesses that really have done well are those that st stick to a business model that they feel is sustainable and live through that uh, short-term pressures. But clearly, if one were to succumb to that, there are clearly consequences that one has to bear. Do you think investors have got a greater role in trying to influence what the corporates do? Do you think investors have got yeah. a, a greater role in trying to influence what the corporates do in terms we heard earlier about in the UK about actually telling companies, no, we don't want those quarterly numbers. They're not helpful. Uh, absolutely. And um, in fact, uh, as an exchange, we're mindful of that. And uh, I mentioned uh, earlier in the year in January uh, in terms of uh, our review over time, uh, in terms of whether there's a need for quarterly reporting. Uh, we have not come to the conclusion yet. We recognize uh, that some of the short-term pressures uh, could be uh, helped or eased uh, with some changes. So at the moment, you require quarterly reporting? At the moment in Singapore, we require quarterly reporting. So well, how do you explain that to this room? <laughs> Pretty much everyone in this room is, is uh, very concerned about that short-termism. Don't you think it engenders short-termism? We'll, we'll take, uh, as when we come out with a consultation, we'll take those on board. And uh, as an exchange, as an operator, you clearly have to listen to uh, feedback from stakeholders. Another issue that does concern a lot of people in this room is the fact that your listing advisory committee has voted in favour of dual class share structures. So in other words, some shares are more equal than others or more powerful than others. And it's a decision that in Singapore has got some support because a lot of people think that it will help attract new listings. But it also created a lot of concern that it could raise the possibility of abuse of power by certain shareholders. Uh, first, I think dual class shares, uh, if I to call that clearly, is a topic of much interest, and I'm sure the uh, audience in this room would have a, a strong opinion uh, on that. But first, let me state that uh, whether we eventually have a dual class share structure uh, is not the end all uh, for us to try and attract big, big listings. Uh, I think there are many other things that we could do. But in the dual class uh, share structure that uh, has been um, announced in terms of uh, the listing advisory committee giving uh, the go-ahead uh, to consider. Uh, what has not been said, which will come out uh, at the right time soon, is what are the safeguards that were put in place uh, on the dual class structure. And then more importantly, we'll come out with a consultation and we'll take views on board. And at the end of the day, whatever we decide, we need to balance and take a view that we think uh, is best for market development. Why is it best for market development now to have a dual class structure in Singapore? Because as an exchange, we must be mindful that uh, companies of different form, of different models, must have a way to access the capital market when they need that. So on our exchange beside the main board, we have a capitalist board that, require, uh, that uh, allows companies, uh, growth companies in particular, to come through, while also uh, uh, granting uh, and, uh, a grant to a platform uh, called CapBridge that allows early stage companies to come in. 
So I think it's important in an exchange where you allow different forms of capital and different sets of companies to come in. And I think dual class is one of those structures where some companies just need that in their early stage of development. You said yourself earlier that Singapore is the most internationalised exchange in the region. Uh, there is another, from those who are concerned about this move, uh, fear that it will be just the start of what they would call a slippery slope, that if you adopt it, every other exchange in the region will adopt it. Uh, if you look at the markets in the region, uh, while every market has grown uh, in its own right and its own way, uh, each of the markets is still quite different. Uh, you don't have a common market infrastructure, you don't have a common market regulation. So I think each market will take uh, on what their needs are, and I don't think there will be many of those copycats, I think. Just another question, something that is very important in terms of sustainability is diversity, whether it's diversity of gender or, or any other form of diversity, but I do want to ask you about gender. Uh, there might be people in this room who are surprised to learn that the percentage of female directors on Singapore exchange listed companies is less than 10%. It was 9.5% last year. That was up, but uh, while it's rising, it's rising ever so slowly. Why is that and how can you change it? Uh, I think we can do better. Uh, so for a start, as an exchange, you need to lead by example. So three of our 11 directors uh, on our board are female. So we're better than the average. And I think we need to uh, try and set it as an example. But I think two more importantly, uh, we need to change the way boards look at uh, how they sustain a company. And diversity, whether that's gender or not, is clearly important for any board to function well. Uh, including renewal directors. Uh, the Diversity Action uh, Council, which was formed two years ago, uh, has the governmental support. Uh, SGX is a participant uh, to that. And with that, uh, we're awaiting some of the uh, recommendations that will come out in due course and see how SGX can further enhance that by working with companies and boards. Is it like uh, ESG more broadly? Is it making companies understand that it's, you quantifi quantifiably do better when you do better on ESG measurements? Is that something that you think corporates don't quite get their heads around? Uh, I think it will. I think they do. Uh, it will be a journey, just as we started with uh, making uh, uh, sustainability reporting uh, on a voluntary basis in 2011. Uh, it's the, but that didn't yeah. quite work. <laughs> it, 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 it quite worked. Uh, we're now making it mandatory, but on a comply or explain basis. And we have five principles for people to think about. Clearly more in terms of you need to articulate what are your business risks, how you're dealing with that, how you're measuring that, and then how is the board evaluating that. And we'll, we'll look at that uh, together with uh, diversity. Mr. Lobun Chai, many thanks. Please thank you to uh, the Singapore Exchange CEO. Thank you.